Six months ago, I changed jobs. I was coming to the end of my second mat leave when I saw a posting that I couldn't resist, and so I applied. And I have to tell you, I'm terribly glad that I did. The people I work with are brilliant and generous and amazing. And it's the job I've really been looking for, even though I didn't know what I was looking for, for 10 years. And the process of going back to work had its ups and downs. Um, I, my commute is three times longer than it was. I can't do the daycare pickup at the end of the day. And a lot of the sort of working it out and the flexibility and the, the way in which it's really worked uh, is credit to my husband who's here in the audience today. It made me think a lot about having it all. That phrase, Anne-Marie Slaughter, turned into a cultural lightning rod earlier this year when she published her article in The Atlantic. If you're a woman and you work, or if there's a woman in your life who does, slaughter raised questions you can't ignore. What does it mean to have it all? Is it doable? Is it sustainable? Is having it all even the right phrase? I think of it as the space between meaningful work and family and social obligations and those personal pursuits you can't let go of, which for me are writing fiction and now blogging. And then, there's all the other stuff. <laughs> I'll bet everyone in this room has three things. Think of them right now. Three things you can't get to that never make it to the top of your list, no matter how hard you try. Number one is my home office desk. It's looked like that since that second delightful baby was born, and I've accepted it's going to continue to look like that for the indefinite future. <laughs> Maybe for you it's a project you can't get started, or volunteer work you'd really like to do, or a relationship that's gone a bit pear-shaped on you, or any of a number of other household chores. And I suspect it's this tension between the mountain of things we want to do and the finite number of hours in the day that drive our fascination with the women who have it all. So who are these women? Christine Lagarde, Margaret Atwood, Condoleezza Rice, Hillary Clinton, Vera Wang, Heather Reisman. Oh, I'm sorry, that's Arianna Huffington, my bad. Heather Reisman, Sarah Blakely, The Mighty Opes. I'm sure there's many you would put on that list too. They're the women whom Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg rightly argued we need more of at the top. But there's a problem. When I look at these women and their accomplishments and I think about my own life, mostly I just want to laugh. If my life is already borderline crazy, how do they do it? Now granted, there's stuff that go with those positions, you know, your nannies, your assistants, your drivers, your, your maids, the, the money to pay them all. But still, how do you scale your commitments when you're not also scaling the number of hours in the day? Now, the media like to hold these women, whoops, what happened there? Okay. The media like to hold these women up to us, there we go, as examples for what's possible. And while I enjoy reading about them or watching videos as much as the next person, I question their use value. As someone who works in marketing, I feel there's an intervening layer of PR that's inevitably going to prevent you from getting the full story. We can't hear about all the challenges and the successes and especially the failures because politically very few people can afford to make themselves the hero because that always means making somebody the villain. And so I wonder, I wonder why Marissa Mayer decided to go back to work two weeks after having her first kid, but do I know anything about it? No, none of us do. But that didn't stop the cultural judgment train, did it? Do I know anything about what Mayer's life is like on a day-to-day -day basis? No. But I think the really funny thing is, if you asked her, she'd probably tell you she hasn't figured it out either, any more than Slaughter has, or I have, or you have. Because to be human is to be caught in the flux, to be caught between one thing and the next and seeking balance constantly. And we heard some great talks this morning about that. And so that's why I'm much more interested in mythic representations of what it means to be a woman and to work. I'm more interested in mythic stories and mythic women who I feel are intimately more knowable. So I want to talk to you about the real superheroes, the ones with capes and strange powers and leather outfits. <laughs> I want to talk to you about superheroes. 
Now I'm not going to assume that you share my deeply geeky appreciation for this topic, so we're going to work through some of the background here. This is the website Women in Refrigerators. I jumped to it early so you'd have a little time to look at it. It was started in 1999 by Gail Simone, who is a comic book writer, and she noticed a very disturbing trend. A lot of the names on this list are women who are in the lives of male superheroes, you know, the girlfriends, the family members, the Aunt Mays. Um, but a lot of them are female superheroes in their own right. And regardless of which category they fall into, there's a disturbing pattern. I find it disturbing anyway. The women go crazy, they lose their power, and they die. Now you may be thinking, okay, it's a superhero story, isn't that like par for the course? Well, yes and no. Because superhero stories are full of epic showdowns and world-ending cataclysms and a lot of drama and ridiculous plot twists, if we're being perfectly honest. But the difference, as John Bartol makes clear in his rebuttal list, Dead Men Defrosting, which you can find <laughs> on the same website, is that when a male superhero has a crisis event, he recovers. 99 times out of 100, he comes back even stronger than before. So why this difference? I think that when you look at superhero stories, they're one of the many canaries in our cultural coal mine. And like any series of myth, they tell us what we value and where the tensions are. And when you look at stories where female superheroes are the focus and not the token or the love interest, what I see is a working out to the barriers of having it all. Because female superheroes are encumbered in ways their male counterparts are not. And so in the interest of time, while there are many stories I would love to talk about, Battlestar Galactica comes to mind, Twilight comes to mind, I'm actually going to focus on Buffy the Vampire Slayer as she appears in the television show of the same name, that's her on your left, and Jean Grey as she appears in the X-Men film franchise. And what you need immediately notice about Buffy and Jean is that they fight evil with their families. They're makeshift families, families of choice, but they're both all focused on this shared goal, which is saving humanity and protecting the world. Now have a think about how different that is from, say, your Batman, right? Let's have a think about him for a sec. What's Batman got going on? He's got some dead parents. He's got this revolving door of girlfriends who provide distraction, and who's he got keeping it real on the home front? Alfred the butler, who he pays to manage his stuff. Batman's story is about dealing with the emotional isolation that comes from his dual identity, which is very different than the dynamic you see in the female stories. It's actually a lot more effective to fight evil with your family. We're told Buffy is the best slayer ever because she works within a team. The X-Men win because they use their powers in complementary ways, but there's a very big problem too when you bring your family to work, which is that when work follows you home, and we all know it inevitably does, it puts targets on the backs of the people you love the most. And when you're the strongest person on your team, as Buffy is, and as Jean is when she's in her phoenix form or embracing that power, however you want to phrase it, the burden of everyone else's safety falls to you. So what does that burden look like? In season five of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Buffy acquires a sister, Dawn. And I say acquired because, crazy plot twist alert, Dawn is a trans-dimensional key made human flesh sent to Buffy so that, stay with me, honest, so that the hell god glory cannot use her to unmake the world, okay? So just sort of accept that as Buffy has to over the season. What else has Buffy got going on? Well, her mom gets a brain tumor, and her only boyfriend who isn't a vampire leaves her because he's emasculated by her power. And she has to drop out of college to help out at home, even though she really wanted to try and be more than a vampire slayer. <laughs> and Glory starts to figure out that Buffy and Dawn are, are related, and every time she and Buffy throw down, Buffy loses, because Glory's a god. And then her mom dies. And then Buffy's the head of her household, and she's responsible for Dawn in this whole other way. And Glory keeps coming, and Buffy can't stop her. And Glory kidnaps Dawn, and she's intending to kill her. And Buffy spends the second last episode of season five in a deep state of catatonic shock, because she accepts for one minute that Dawn will die, and Glory will win, and it's her fault. And it's so crippling, that guilt, that she's literally paralyzed. 
Okay, so that's Buffy. <laughs> On the other side of the superhero fence, we have Jean. And Jean, like in film one, she's got it all, man. She is a medical doctor. She can move stuff with her mind. Score. She has a hot fiance who's also a mutant and who's really nice to her. When the mutants go to Congress to advocate for human for rights, it's a very clear parallel to the gay rights movement in America. It's Jean who goes to Congress to advocate for them. It's the first time we see her in the film. And when they're at home at uh, Professor X's School for Gifted Mutants, Jean is a teacher there. And she has this meaningful mentorship relationship with all the other students there. And she and her sister Storm are basically den mothers to all the young X-Men. So it's all sunshine and roses, right? Only Jean has a power that scares the hell out of Professor X. Jean is a phoenix. And he's barricaded her phoenix power deep in her mind without her consent when she was very young. And so when she's like, I'd like to learn to be a telepath, he's like, no. And she's like, OK. But throw in a few scenarios where uh, Jean's family is in danger, and she's the make break between success and failure. And what do you think she's going to do? She does what we all do. She's willing to put it all on the line to save her family. And by the end of X2, she's unleashed this crazy flood. Imagine Niagara Falls but barreling down a hill toward you. And you're, the, her family are all in their X-Jet, which has stalled. Again, convenient plot point. <laughs> and that brings us to a very deep problem with these stories. At the end of season five of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Buffy commits suicide to protect her sister and the world. And at the end of X2, X-Men United, Jean commits suicide to protect her family. And if you ever get the chance, I invite you to watch these scenes, because scene for scene, line for line, they're the same. And here's how it goes. Step one, assess the threat. And damn, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Step two, have this moment where you realize, I can end this threat. And if I end this threat, I'll end any and all other threats that will otherwise follow me home and mess with my family. Step three, have a deep moment of emotional response to this knowledge, which you see relatively captured here. And for Jean, it reads as a kind of resigned determination because she knows that her power is out of control and she can't stop it. And which for Buffy comes across as this kind of zealous moment of clarity in which all the crap she's dealt with over the previous five seasons falls away. And she has a beautiful purpose and it's so clear. And all she has to do is die. Because don't kid yourselves. Death is not a gift that Buffy's giving to the world, as we're told in season five over and over. Death is a gift for her. Step four, tell your family that they need to get on board with this suicide plan. <laughs> Step five, resist any and all counter offers and denials and reprisals and all that when your family understandably are not on board with the suicide plan. Step six, die willingly. In Buffy's case, you might say, happily. Now I want you to picture Spider-Man doing the same thing. <laughs> it's pretty weird, isn't it? Because while women have been making sacrifices for hearth and home since the days of Persephone and the Greeks, superheroes are supposed to die when they're beaten. They're supposed to die because they are too slow or too weak or too stupid. Not because the universe is giving them a one-way, irreproachable ticket off the never-ending stress ride that is finding the space between meaningful work and actual living. Now, it won't shock you that they don't stay dead. <laughs> it's just, and, you know, when you're looking at the heroes of superhero stories, it's just not done, really. You know, you pick yourself up, you go again. And by go again, I mean get caught in the same cycle. Because Jean can't be the phoenix and still be someone you'd like to have coffee with. <laughs> she comes back from the dead as this fiance-killing, over-sexualized monster. And when she's lucid, all she does is ask for death. And the story gives it to her. Because I'm not aware of a plot line in the X-Men universe where Jean can be her powerful phoenix self and not be crazy or give up her power or die. Now, Buffy does better. 
you can look at seasons six and seven as Buffy's attempt to return to that place of emotional clarity that she experienced right before her death. Her slayer powers come back, no problem. She's killing vamps and taking names. But it takes a long time for her to come back to a place that feels, that feels right. And she gets there with the help of her friend Willow, who is a killer witch, fortunately. I don't mean she kills people, I mean she's really good at it. Um, and they cook up this spell where they take Buffy's power and they give it to every woman in the world who could be a vampire slayer. And it's a really powerful moment in the show, and the first time I saw it, it made me really, really mad. I was disappointed. I bought into the idea of Buffy as a lone wolf superhero, which is totally nonsensical, because she's always worked within a team. But I wanted her to succeed on those terms. I wanted her to be like the male superheroes. And now that I'm older, and I've been around the block a few more times in terms of my working life, I see the real wisdom in that decision. Because Buffy was caught in a paradigm that was unsustainable. She had given her life for her job, not once, but actually twice. I sort of skipped over the first death. <laughs> and she was brave enough to change the rules. So, what do we make of these stories? One, we are deeply ambivalent as a culture about what it means to be a woman and to have power. Two, we are still figuring out how to tell stories where a woman achieves the pinnacle of power and doesn't suffer self-destruction or suicide or some kind of implosion, however you want to read the metaphor, as part of that journey, as a way station in her self-development, even in superheroic circles where anything is possible. And that, that is disturbing to me. And so I'd say to anyone out there who's involved in creating stories like this, and I'd also like to note, it hasn't escaped my knowledge that all of the women in these stories more or less are white. That Halle Berry, who plays Storm, gets through three movies without coming anywhere near close to a meaningful plot line. That Kelly Wu, who plays the Asian assassin in X-Men 2, is silent until she dies. And much as I love Buffy, it's not a show that's really recognized for its cultural diversity. <laughs> And so we need to tell stories that include all women and the people involved in these shows, whether they're actors, directors, producers, what have you. We need them to find new ways to tell this story because I think if they find new ways to tell it and we have hours, if not years, to reflect on Buffy and Jean and their motivations and read them against the grain of our own lives, I think we will find new ways to live it. Now I want to leave with two signs that maybe things are changing for the better. Oh yeah, I kind of skipped over that, oh well. This is Natasha Romanoff of the recent Avengers film franchise. And while she's a bit of a token character, and yes, I would love it if Joss Whedon fixed that, she's nobody's love interest. Her superpower is her brain, and she more or less holds her own with the men. So that's encouraging, and I don't think Natasha's gonna end up in a fridge. But I'm even more interested in Game of Thrones which is a show that's about women and men and power because ladies, if we're gonna change the cultural narratives, we need men on board. We need men involved and participating. I'm very interested in Daenerys Targaryen, who you see pictured here, the child queen in exile who leads a makeshift family, who has a superpower, and who suffers terrible loss. And there's this moment at the end of season one when her husband and her unborn son die and it looks like she's considering suicide. And her advisor turns to her and is all like, dude, I totally cannot watch you do this. And her response is utter incomprehension. Is that what you fear for me, she asks. And she walks into that fire and she emerges unscathed as one of the most powerful women in her world. Thank you. <laughs>